let me um, introduce our guest for today. I'm very happy to have Jasmine Clark with us, joining us this morning um, for the iSchool Colloquium series, Inclusive Futures. Uh, Jasmine is the Digital Scholarship in Africology and African American Studies Librarian at Temple University in the, the great city of Philadelphia. Our primary areas of research are accessibility and metadata in emerging technology and emerging technology centers. Uh, she's doing research on 3D metadata, the development of Section 508 compliant guidelines for virtual reality experiences. She's the chair of the Digital Library Federation Digital Accessibility Working Group, as well as the co-chair of DLF's Committee for Equity and Inclusion. So um, well, welcome to uh, Tucson virtually. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to, to hear uh, what she has to say about her project. And if there are if there are questions that come up that need to be answered the moment, we can we can pause for a minute or you can um, save them to the end. So great, take it away, Jasmine. Hi, thanks. So um, uh, got a lot of ground to cover. So we're going to just read the first slide. Hi, I'm Jasmine Clark, Digital Scholarship Librarian, as Zach just pointed out, Temple University Librarian, um, libraries in Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to be discussing the virtual blocks and using virtual reality to teach Black archival research. So um, to give context to everything I'm going to be talking about so that you're not uh, just jumping into random parts of the project, what is the virtual blocks in? Three things. The virtual reality, it's a virtual reality game that aims to teach high school seniors primary source literacy skills. We are creating a prototype at this point, um, focusing on Black art and artists associated with the Pyramid Club. Once again, I will explain all of this. Um, and the game aims to advance Dr. Bloxon's goals and work. So we're going to start from the bottom, and then we're going to work our way up from these three points. So let's first and foremost discuss Dr. Bloxon and the philosophical underpinnings of the virtual Bloxon. The responsibility for preserving the record of our history is a weighty and important one indeed. I accepted it years ago from the long distance, distance runners of Black bibliophilia and will one day pass the baton to the next generation of runners after a distance arduously but lovingly and rewardingly run. Uh, this is a quote by Dr. Charles L. Bloxon himself. He is still alive. That is a photo of Dr. Bloxon to the left of the screen. He is the curator uh, uh, emeritus. I forget his formal title, still of the Bloxon Collection. Speaking of which, the Charles L. Bloxon Afro-American Collection. Um, so Dr. Bloxon grew up in Norristown, Pennsylvania. It is a suburb north of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, roughly. Um, when he was nine years old, he asked his teacher what Negroes had contributed to history. And she said, Negroes have no history. Uh, this would lead him immediately down a path, and I mean immediately, he collected his first item, I think he says when he was nine years old as a result of this, uh, to a lifelong history of collecting everything and anything he could find related to the history of people of African descent. Uh, in 1984, Dr. Bloxon donated this collection um, to Temple University. There's a smaller portion of it at Penn State, but the larger portion of it is at Temple University in Sullivan Hall. And it has grown to over 700,000 items and is one of the nation's leading research facilities for the study of history and culture of people of African descent. Um, this, these, it is a truly multimedia, and this is really important when we talk about VR, but it is a truly multimedia cross, a very broad, uh, covers a broad chronological time, uh, set of time periods uh, collection, right? So we see here listed books manuscripts, sheet music, pamphlets, journals, newspaper, broadsides, posters, photographs, but there's also art, um, statues, sculpture, musical instruments, which you'll see, um, as well as, for example, um, we have the Tupac collect collection, which includes uh, medallions that belong to Tupac, as well as handwritten notes and verses uh, written by him. The oldest item I've handled while visiting the collection goes back to, I want to say the 16th or 15th century. So when we say a broad time span and a number of subjects and topics and types of materials, um, this is what I mean. Um, and of course, it exists. To, this calls back to Bloxon's mission, right? Rectifying and, and correcting the erasure of um, Black history. And I use Black for, uh, in terms of uh, setting, uh, norm setting, I use black to describe once again, anyone of African descent. 
African American, of course, being a specific of African American. Uh, that term can be political, but um, someone who more or less identifies as someone who is a direct descendant of African Americans of American enslave enslavement or has multiple generations or identifies as American and Black. Let's go with that. Um, so. Here we see a photo of the entrance to the Bloxon collection. You'll see that we have, you can't really see it, but to the left there's a photo of Michelle Obama um, and the Obama family, but on either side, you actually can't see it. There are cases of vinyls of popular music uh, through various ages. You'll see we have statues, there's art, there's a number of things. Um, and this is what you see when you first come to the collection. We're starting to move into the VR section, right? So. Let's talk about the virtual blocks in itself really quickly. This is a really old, we have a slightly updated room, but this is the one, this is the screenshot I have on hand that I use for these things. Uh, to the left, you'll see a virtual recreation of the space on the right, which is the blocks and reading room. Um, you'll see Jordan Hample, who is our, our VR, de uh, VR developer, as well as the technician for our space doing photogrammetry, which is how we created the 3D models that you see on the table on the right, on the left, sorry, on the right actual space on the left. There we go. So um, on the left, you'll see that there are three musical instruments. Um, and on the right, you actually see two of those instruments on the table. So it wrapped in plastic is the drum that you see in the middle of the, on the left. And at the very back of the right, you'll see the Liberian slot drum. It is a Liberian slot drum from I think the 19th century, uh, sitting at the front of the table on the left. So um, we, this is just to give you an idea of what we're going for. Um, so before we get into the virtual reality part, let's uh, discuss what primary source literacy is and what standards we're holding ourselves to with that. So um, we are using the SAA, ACRL, or VMS guidelines for primary source literacy. What do all those letters mean? Um, the, they're just acronyms for the organizations that made them. SAA is the Society of American Archivists. Uh, ACRL is the Association of College and Research Libraries. And RBMS is a subsection of ACRL. That's the rare books and manuscripts section of ACRL there. Just so you know that we're not just making it up. These are the people who <laughs> work in primary source literacy. Uh, they developed a joint task force. And while these are developed for um, undergraduate research, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, uh, most archival research in terms of primary source literacy tends to focus on the college age. Um, these can be adapted for K through 12 as we are doing. Um, they define primary sources as, as materials that come in a number of formats um, that serve as original evidence documenting a time period, an event, work, people, or ideas. When I teach you know, kids primary sources, <laughs> intro, intro to archives, I simply say, a primary source is something that was made by or during a specific time that you're actually researching as opposed to a secondary, secondary source, which would cite a primary source. A secondary source is something like a textbook. A primary source is something like a journal written by the figure you're actually researching. Um, it, this, these guidelines articulate the range of knowledge, skills, and abilities required to effectively use primary sources. Um, and this is a really important point. Uh, point. Primary source literacy is the combination of knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to effectively find, interpret, evaluate, and ethically use primary sources within specific disciplinary contexts. And here's the really key part, in order to create new knowledge or to revise existing understandings. Um, when you really boil down to those last two things, creating new knowledge or, or revising existing knowledge, there's anybody here who's a PhD or a scholar knows exactly how much effort and work goes into that process and that the actual skills required to do so is not as simple as I know where to find a, a, an art, a resource or I know how to, like, you know, I know how to read it. Um, so when we talk about this, these guidelines have five learning objectives. Uh, students need to be able to conceptualize. So kind of a broader understanding of what a primary source is and how they're used. Uh, find and access primary sources. Uh, read, understand, and summarize the, these. So not necessarily in, in, interpret or analyze, just read the things that they're, in, they're seeing and understand them and, and repeat back what they've encountered. Interpret, analyze, and evaluate. Now we're getting into that more complex um, level of cognitive load. And then use and incorporate those to create new knowledge or, exi or revise existing understandings. And that doesn't necessarily mean publication. When you're doing genealogical research, you're literally creating new knowledge or interpreting things to generate new understandings of your family history, right? Um, 
And I really quickly want to emphasize why I felt that this was particularly important for high school students. Um, and actually, I think the next, so let's go into the pedagogical approach because that'll give a little bit more before I go into that spiel. So while this is gonna be free and totally open to anyone who wants to use it, the game is designed for high school students and is currently focused on Philadelphia because that's where we're gonna be doing our assessment and rollout work. Um, Philadelphia schools are 52% black, 22% Latinx. And if you're familiar with Philadelphia, that means the large proportion of that population that's Latinx is Caribbean. Dominican and Puerto Rican, meaning heavily still of African descent. 13% uh, white, which has gone down in the last four years, 7% Asian and 5% multiracial or other. One to 2% of that multiracial, that other is gonna be Native American and then multiracial still includes people who are also mixed with black. So um, anybody who goes to Philadelphia public schools understands exactly why this is relevant. Um, and will, this will be in line with common core standards. So I don't have as much here about this, but Philadelphia, like many urban schools, has suffered a huge number of school closings. I think they closed 22 in one year or in the last like in a two year span, a few years back. They have, I think it's now nine, eight librarians. You can count on your hands how many librarians they have for the, all of the schools uh, in the district. This includes charters. Um, and when you think about it, well, let's go back to Dr. Bloxon's mission. That erasure, especially you see it now with the anti-CRT laws, right? The erasure of Black history and the, who, the, the analysis of who has control of that, those issues have not changed. Um, and when it comes down to it, the right to have agency over telling our own stories for ourselves is really, really crucial. But most primary source literacy research is conducted post-college, post-second, post-secondary. So college, undergraduates, specifically at university, like research universities. Um, many low-income African, while the graduation rates have been improving, going to college isn't necessarily, the rates aren't as necessarily as high for the demographic of people who need access to their own history the most. So developing a game that is not focused on having to get out of high school is really, really crucial. Um, for, for that reason. Um, we would hope that younger kids still can use it, but because this producing knowledge and doing all this is still a slightly higher level um, activity, we felt high school would be a better age group for this. Um, with that in mind, we will be doing, uh, making sure that this is in line with common core standards so that um, social studies teachers can implement this and integrate this into the coursework, uh, into their classrooms. Um, and it will consist of multiple game levels. So let's talk about the actual themes of the game. Um, it will break into four thematic categories related to Black American life, which will be sports, leisure, arts, and culture, um, and protests. Um, and we are focusing on the Sankofa teaching model, so which is a form of culturally relevant education or pedagogy. Um, and let's talk about that a bit more. So let's discuss VR in pursuit of Sankofa. Sankofa is an African word from the Akan, Ga tribe, Akan tribe in Ghana, the literal translation of the word and the symbol, the symbol down here to the bottom right is the uh, Dinkra symbol for uh, Sankofa, means it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. The word is derived from the word san, which is to return, ko, which is to go, fa, to look, seek, and take. So the virtual blocks in looks to help students think through this idea of, of Sankofa and history methods, and we'll get into that, um, by having them understand how history constructs identity, ownership and agency over historical materials. And you'll note that this isn't totally out of line with the SAA guidelines. They're very much complementary. Um, and responsibility in preserving and telling those stories. And um, when I say responsibility, I mean that two ways. One, ethically uh, obtaining materials and doing those things in an ethical way, but also once you understand the role, the way history is constructed and the way that ma marginalized groups, not just, Af not just those of African descent, but the history written by the winners, right? The way people who are not at, um, at the top of the power scale, the way their histories are oftentimes excluded, figuring out what your responsibility, what your role within that is. So responsibility meaning um, both ways. Um, in addition, so we've talked about the philosophical underpinnings. That's great. How do actual teachers, you know, use this? Um, we're, we're, we're real close. We're creating a teaching toolkit. 
So teaching the teaching toolkit will incorporate um, guidelines to incorporating VR into a classroom, just practically, things to consider like accessibility, how do you manage you know, a, a large number of kids, things you may wanna consider, alternative ways to use this game, uh, ways to set up visits to the Scholar Studios Immersive Studio. So to the bottom right, you'll see there's a room with blue tape on the floor, that's our immersive studio. Uh, uh, you'll see to the kind of in the left corner, there's a screen. We actually do a lot of K through 12 tours and kids love to come in and play in the space because on the screen, they can see what the person in the headset is seeing. So it creates a collaborative game experience where they get to be like, look to your left, look to your right. And it's very engaging. It's very popular. It works very well. And if a teacher doesn't want to uh, have all, all chaos break loose <laughs> in their classroom with all these headsets and VR experiences. We are setting up a way for them to register to come in and just use the VR immersive studio, have a nice little field trip, have the students play the game, and then they can go back to the classroom for the assignment component. Um, we also will include readings and assignments on things like repatriation of materials. So getting into that ethical discussion around how, how do these collections get these materials and discussing things like repatriation and ownership. Um, critical archival literature for a high school level. So things like descriptive standards, um, you know, describing P, uh, Black people as enslaved versus slaves, right? Understanding the power of language and the need to recognize that this was something put upon them. It was not their entire identity. And it was also, once again, done to them. Who's doing this to them, right? Um, as well as things like curation, who's curating the collections you're seeing, who gets to pick who's buying, um, what's being bought and included and, and what's not. Um, we're also going to be dealing with things like um, assignments, including things like assignments, exploring art, gender and other nuances of blackness. So that's just like, you know, standard assignments as part of the games, out learning outcomes in some ways. And we'll also be providing access to the 3D models and other digital assets. So down to the bottom again, you'll see the first image on the left, there we go, is a photo of Romare Bearden. He's a seminal Black artist, African-American artist, um, and he's sitting in the Pyramid Club. We're about to get into all of that. Um, and then in the middle, there's the 3D model of that drum. So for students who, maybe some teachers are just not going to want to have students play the game too actively, they'll still have access to these materials and be able to teach around them and do that separately. All right, let's get into the prototype. So I mentioned the Pyramid Club. What is the Pyramid Club? Um, first of all, to the left is a photo of the Pyramid Club space. It's a house that is still standing near 15th and Girard. It is now apartments, but there's actually going to be a historical marker, marker place, I believe, this year. Uh, it was established in 1937 for the cultural, civic, and social advance advancement of Negroes in Philadelphia. Its members were Black middle class and upper class professionals, including physicians, dentists, lawyers, businessmen. Um, and it became an important space for socializing and the arts, and actually even more than that, as well as political organizing. Um, it, organized, it organized and created a meeting place for civic activities, professional meetings, fashion shows, society weddings, entertainment events, parties, lectures, and other events. Um, and here's the big thing we'll be talking about. Its annual art exhibit, exhibitions became major events uh, that attra attracted many Black artists that would go on to prominence, like Doc's Thrash, Horace Pippin, and Romare Bearden, um, Selma Actually, I'll have photos, we'll get there. But um, it actually was so prominent and so important that it actually eventually integrated because white artists also wanted to be included in the art shows. Um, it was controversial, Don't make, I'm, it's not as simple as I made it sound. That's actually a big part of the records, but just to give you an idea of how um, prominent these art exhibits became. In addition, you've been seeing all these photos, who took them? John W. Mosley. John W. Mosley was, uh, was one of the premier photo journal journalists of 20th century Philadelphia. In the East, he kind of gone to Jersey and New York as well, um, but really big in Philadelphia. The Bloxon has many of his photos, including many of the Pyramid Club. So to the top left corner, you'll see John Mosley himself. It's a self-portrait with his camera. Um, to the opposite corner to the right, you'll see a photo of Mary McLeod, Beth, I can never say her name, um, Beth Yoon, um, a former, a very important uh, educator, civil rights at, at activist and philanthropist. She's established colleges and schools. Um, you'll see down to right below her on the right is Josephine Baker coming to visit for, uh, to the Pyramid Club. In the middle, you'll see Kwame Nkrumah, as well as a number of West African uh, delegates. Kwame Nkrumah is one of the people, major figures involved in Ghana's independence from Great Britain and became the first prime minister of modern day Ghana. He's oftentimes credited with kind of the formation and stability of modern day Ghana. Um, and then to the very 
bottom left is Marian Anderson, the first Black opera singer to, an a Philadelphia native, uh, to sing with the New York Metropolitan Opera and at the White House as well. Um, a very prominent figure. And the reason I include these is not just to show you the prominence, these beautiful photos, but to also explain one, the diversity and prominence of the Pyramid Club and the kinds of people you see. And three, what John W. Mosley has captured. If you're ever interested, you should always explore his photos. Uh, he captures a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, the Pyramid Club, and, and outside of this, I actually did a whole Twitter thread. Um, the Pyramid Club hosted Einstein, Dr. Oppenheimer, who was one of the people responsible for the bomb, the infamous bomb, but also became a nuclear activist to try to get us to de-arm. Um, they fought the Red Scare. There was a big pu uh, push within the Pyramid Club to organize against pushing back against the Red Scare and McCarthyism. So, um, <laughs> and regularly hosted Kennedy before he was president. Uh, we have a number of letters there. So when I say like this, um, some of the prominent organizers here, I have, I was talking about Sam Evans, who was, I believe, the chairman, I forget his title, he was high up at the Pyramid Club, and casually wrote, uh, we have Kennedy there, Einstein there, we've got Truman, he casually wrote Truman and was like, hey, come for lunch, and Truman was like, okay. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the prominence of the space, that's kind of what we're, we're getting at. So let's talk about the Pyramid Club and this art, the Black Art and art Arts exhibitions. Um, so this iteration of the game itself will introduce students to Black artists and art of the 1940s. When we talk about Black art, it's often really popular to talk about the Harlem Renaissance, but the 1930s and 40s are like that following period where we get to see the transition between that and the Black arts movements of the 1960s, um, 50s and 60s. Um, through arts and through art and artists, students will explore issues of class, colorism, gender, and identity within the Black community. Um, broader historical events and information will also be introduced, like the Public Works Administration and World War II. Um, the biggest thing I wanted to, so one, uh, <laughs> full disclosure, if you can't guess, uh, I was an art history undergraduate student. I studied Black arts, Black material culture, um, double majored with African American studies um, and in market in, and archivist by trade. Uh, one of the biggest things I wanted to avoid was discussing blackness through a lens of struggle or opposition against whiteness. Yes, it's important to discuss political organizing, but I wanted us to really get into the dialogues and understandings of historical events from black perspectives at the time. What was the, so when you look at World War II, we, and I, the dialogue around, for example, black veterans is very similar to what you hear from Vietnam later on with, with white veterans where they're like, we went, we fought for our country, we came back and we were being lynched. Um, but it's, so it's, I want students to kind of, um, but not in this iteration per se, but I want the lens to be focused on how are we discussing these topics? Not in, and also beyond just lynching and, and persecution, also things like the lack of unity. And the example I'm gonna give later on, we'll get into this, but I really wanted to talk about framing um, for students and their understanding of the historical outcomes here. So let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, let's talk about gameplay mechanics. And um, this is a very obvious high overview. The core objective of the virtual blocks is for players to score a high researcher ranking in the game. This is accomplished via three things. Um, one, you have to identify objects associated with a broad research question. So really it's gonna be a research question that gets increasingly refined as you become a higher, as you score higher level researcher rankings. Um, you will have to request materials so, um, and that you'll see in the next slide, but you'll request materials, um, go through materials that are recreated materials from the actual blocks and collection, and then you will enter recreated spaces in the Pyramid Club based off of those Mosley photos that we showed you. While in those Mosley scenes, they'll encounter NPCs or non-player characters and objects that will give them clues that they'll be able to keep in a notebook. They will then use those clues to come out of the game, request more materials, and have that iterative, if you've ever done archival research, that iterative back and forth of finding materials, going down a rabbit hole, coming back, requesting more materials, and as they do so, encountering more and more clues, which then ups their ranking as a researcher. They will collect additional information from those sources, as I said, iterative, back and forth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and users will be assessed on the following. So how do you get a high researcher ranking. Um, the number of clues that you unlock out of the available clues. Uh, so if there's 100 available clues, A, B, think of it like an A, B, or C, right? 50%, 70% of the clues, 50% of the clues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the quality of material requests made. So um, also you will get a certain number of hints that 
kind of leads you to request additional sets of materials. Are you requesting all the materials you could be, right? Um, and the level of refinement of their assigned research question and answer. So at the end of the game, they will increasingly see more and more specific questions that go from broad to narrow. Um, and as they are able to connect figures and clues to their assigned research questions, their ability to then kind of continue to refine it, or i.e. unlock more refined research questions, um, give them a higher researcher ranking. So before we go any further, let's ask why do this in the first place? Why gamify? Why make this a video game? Well, what do these two photos have in common? For those of you on who I've always described photos, to the left, we have a kitten staring at a little chaser toy on a ball. And to the right, we have human kittens, little human children playing in a play kitten, a uh, play kitchen. <laughs> um, what do these two things have in common? Well, uh, the, ki the kitten on the right, your cat, with your kittens, when they're like playing and swatting at things, they're not just playing for fun. They're simulating murdering small creatures, right? They're hunting. <laughs> um, and these kids on the right, well, when they play with toys like kitchens and dolls, they're simulating everyday life and pretending that they're cooking or taking care of children. Games are not just for fun. They're oftentimes a method via which we learn mechanisms, the actual mechanisms require these steps, like the rote memory steps approaches to accomplishing certain end goals, right? That are ne necessary to our species, if you want to go like full science, violent, you know, <laughs> evolutionary science. But gamification is really important for the process, not just necessarily the outcome. Um, and I want to emphasize that because with the virtual blocks and as lovely as the black arts are, as lovely as all these things that I want kids to learn, the main emphasis is not that they walk away with knowing who Romare Bearden is per se. Um, the main outcome is that they walk away learning how to learn who Romare Bearden is if that makes sense. Um, we want students to come out and to have agency and understanding of how history is constructed, how you go about digging up those things, how they're getting the, the, when they're reading finished books and secondary sources, how did the scholars or people who wrote those things come to those conclusions? We want them to understand the process. So let's go into the gameplay narrative. Um, so you are now a student, you've entered the virtual block synth. Um, and the prompt is you've been tasked with writing a paper on black art and its role in black lives of people of the 1940s. You enter the archive, encounter the archivist. This is a place full of archivists we have in right now. Um, they will be replaced, sorry. Don't let her know she's laid off. Um, and begin a tour. The tour will introduce you to the collection, blocks and story, um, and begin the onboarding process where you'll learn how to kind of transport and navigate your <laughs> space, move around. Uh, how to access that log or notebook where you'll be keeping your clues, um, how to select and interact with objects, um, how to request materials, uh, relevant terminology, things like what is a collection versus a box or folio or things that you might encounter, um, and also how to win. <laughs> What's your objective? You'll get all of this during this onboarding process in the beginning. So let's go through a track of the game that we're actually in the process of developing right now. And that's gonna be one of the ones in our prototype, uh, one of the more prominent ones. So let's discuss Laura Wheeler Waring. Ms. Waring is the one um, shaking hands with this gentleman in the darker dress in the photo to the left. Um, Laura Wheeler Waring was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1887. She was an art, an art educator and studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, then in Europe until the outbreak of World War I. She would go on to found, teach, and chair the music and art departments at the Cheney Training School for Teachers in Philadelphia for decades. She also continued her work as a commercial artist. She accomplished something that was exceedingly different, difficult at the time, very much so, uh, being a Black commercially successful artist in the United States. At the time, most fine artists had to become expatriates and go to Europe in order to have a career. Um, she, through her whole life, emphasized accessibility, making sure that art was easy and consumable for the public and Black education. She, all her life, spent all her time making more educators to go out to emphasize and promote the arts within the Black community. So teaching other teachers was a big thing. Um, but also, she was a well-known illustrator, but also painter. Um, so you are a student. You're going to encounter clues. What are the clues going to start to introduce you to? Things like this, the, the factual information, the secondary and primary sources that are just basic questions about who Laura Wheeling wearing, who Wheeler Waring was, what kind of work she did, her basic biographical information. We're talking a ranking of one. 
right? This is your lowest ranking at the very least, you know the basics. Let's get a little bit more nuanced though. Let's talk about what a more advanced ranking would be. Let's talk about wearing and gender um, and, and also uh, some other things, but Laura Wheeler Waring was paid less than her male counterparts and late. We, you have letters asking for her money by W.E.B. Du Bois for her work in the crisis. She regularly put, did free or very cheap work for the crisis, which is a black political publication ran by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, her work was criticized by Elaine Locke. So talking about the Harlem Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance was a time period during which the idea of work needing to contribute and be informed in, in, um, by the Black identity, a more Afro African or Afrocentric approach to art. Um, the kind of founding dean, as he was called, of that philosophy was Elaine Locke. Um, so a big name um, was credited, he's credited as developing the founding philosophy, yes, but critiqued her work as being white painted Black. He said her work was not Black enough, in essence. Um, and when you read the text, he wouldn't say that to her if she was a man. <laughs> it's very clearly they're, they're, um, they're, it's very clearly emphasized. Um, and also, we have to come back to her accessibility as an artist. She didn't want to create abstract art deco Afro work. She wanted to create work that the average public would understand and appreciate. She was not coming at this from the point of like a high level academic. She was that was just not her art. That wasn't her approach to art. Um, not saying that she didn't, this is a beautiful painting by Laura Wheeler Waring. She's a very technically trained artist, but he critiqued her for being too white and essence in her work. Um, she ended up marrying a younger man in order to protect her agency and ability to work. I believe he was a decade or so, maybe more younger than her. Um, once again, talking about her needs as a woman during the time um, in order to be able to continue her that agency, she made sure to marry somebody who would in essence stay out of her way and support her. Um, and we talk about, and there's a number of other historical and biographical facts, but these are some of the really important ones where we get into gender, um, sexuality. There's there's aspects of um, Elaine Locke, um, similar to when you talk about Zora Neale Hurston and um, my brain will not remember name right now, Langston Hughes. Uh, where the intersections of queer men and women have come having complex relationships. So if you don't know, they were close friends who then ended up in hard beef for the rest of their lives. Uh, there's a number of aspects. And also the wheeler wearing was unique in that a lot of the Black artists at the time were products of the Great Migration. So they were born in the South, migrated North during the 1920s, came of age in the 1920s, became educated during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, she is a born and bred, just like W.E.B. Du Bois, New Englander. So there are cultural differences at play as well. So you've learned all of this. You've gone through the clues you've collected and how much of that you learn depends on how many clues you've collected, right? <laughs> you've got your basic research question. So let's start with the lowest ranking research question. What were the prominent styles and philosophies that influenced many black artists of the 1940s? At the bare minimum, students should leave with this. They should know the Harlem, how the Harlem Renaissance impacted the styles of art. You move into the Art Deco movement of the 1940s. Um, what were some of the philosophies and conflicting philosophies and approaches and what role Black art was playing? Um, and what artists were very prominent? You're talking about Mary Bearden, uh, Selma Burke, uh, Laura Wheeler Waring, Doc's Thrash. We can go through all of them. There's tons of them. And, and we, then we want students to at least be aware, right? Um, Students are gonna encounter this information, once again, via those recreated primary and secondary sources um, in the collection. So these photographs are just from the collection. These are not, they're just in boxes. So they'll encounter these photographs, but then enter recreated spaces from those photographs and have conversations or overhear conversations. Uh, well, kind of, it'll be text form. <laughs> um, we don't have voice actor money yet, um, but, um, and art objects and objects as well that they will kind of give them clues. They're going to be able to answer questions about issues and facts like those illustrated by Willow Waring's story and use them to form a broader understanding of Black art, Black culture, and Black history. So as opposed to just saying, and I mean, let's, a lot of students receive, you know, surface level understandings of a lot of figures, including things like Harriet Tubman, Emma O.K. You know, all the students, those are figures that even white students in schools kind of, well, I don't know what they do at this point, but they <laughs> traditionally have learned about when they did learn about Black history. But getting into the kind of, um, deeper analysis, you know, I, I guess like the better, a better example is a lot of times like Malcolm X is demonized 
MLK, Malcolm X bad, MLK good. But we are, anybody who's familiar with that dialogue knows it's not that black and white. And we want kids to come out understanding that it's not that black and white and that these resources can be used to kind of suss out and understand nuance um, beyond just what you're basically learning and how you go about sussing that out. Um, they will also ideally understand the iterative nature of primary source research, um, that back and forth that you don't just go in, find one thing that tells you everything you wanna know and then you're done, you've gotta go in learn a little, read a little, request a different collection, learn a little, read a little, go on and, on and back and forth. Um, we want them to understand the relationship between primary and secondary sources. So once again, how did these, now you've encountered all this stuff, how, how is it then interpreted and, and how is that turned into what you're learning in your classrooms? Um, and how primary sources are interpreted into what we understand them as, what to, into what we understand as history and what that means for them. And this goes back to blocks and story. Um, so saying, all right, I don't got all this, not necessarily mechanically, how did they get from point A to point B in terms of how did this become a textbook, but how does my understanding of history, and this goes to that second part of the SAA guidelines, not just creating new knowledge, but re-examining, revisiting existing knowledge. How does this change? Now that I've gone through this myself, what is the nuance, right? And how this becomes quote unquote history. Um, and what this means for them, blocks in this, this idea of what's being left out and what do I want to do about it? What is my responsibility here? Do I have any responsibility? And um, that is a dialogue that many of these artists have had. And that's also why I think that the art is that the arts are important. Romare Bearden would go on to find, to found the Spiral Collective, which was literally just a collective of black artists who were just discussing what their role was as black artists in the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. Um, to have these students understand that this dialogue is not new <laughs> and that this is like a philosophical question of responsibility and role and what you can contribute, what you should contribute, are you obligated to contribute, um, that this is something that, that conversations that have been had by their forebearers and our forefathers for <laughs> as long as you can imagine. Um, and so just and to illustrate to the bottom right of the screen is a photo just to show you what those clues will pop up as. So if you can imagine each of those things as a little clue and there's a text there and you get to read it and collect that clue and store it in your notepad, in your notebook. This is just to give an idea of, um, to make it less uh, hypothetical. <laughs> um, and so at the end, things that we'll be assessing for, um, of course, the pedagogical efficacy. Did kids just learn anything about black art? You know, <laughs> like also have they picked up the methodologies that we're hoping for? Have they developed historical thinking? Uh, the culturally relevant pedagogy side, um, and I'll get into that a bit more, but the, and the retention of basic information, um, not just about the historical figures, but about the archival process. Do they remember what, how to re requ request something? That's really the, the joy of, of uh, gamification, that rote memory can be built in, um, in fun ways. Um, the impact of a collection that centers Blackness, right? So um, within culturally relevant pedagogy, one thing that can be overlooked, we oftentimes talk about representation, 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 but we usually say like, you know, kids need to see people who look like themselves in film or look like themselves in books, but actually authorship is extremely important. Um, it's literature has shown time and time again that kids need to see authors and creators as authoritative figures who look like them. So the idea that this entire collection is not just curated about black people, but created by <laughs> black people and talking about things like that to say, how does that impact them? Um, I actually have a quote and a citation if you want to, you know, go read about culturally, about Sankofa teaching and culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, but it is important to note that it wasn't just references to culture, but the use of textbooks written by people of one's own race that was related to academic success. So these were examining, I believe, HBCU undergraduates. I have to remember, but um, the textbook component, we, what we'd be studying is it is it the same for archives, right? There's also the question about the um, non-white students. So as I pointed out, while Philadelphia is heavily black, there are plenty of non-white, non-black students. And how does, we have a very heavy Vietnamese population. How do Vietnamese students react to um, encountering these collections, right? Um, we are, while we are talking about black history, we're really trying to frame it as what does a marginalized and uh, this is like a broader philosophical thing I'm writing and researching about now, which is what does the concept of Sankofa, what does technology um, 
and what do in service of marginalized people look like and in terms of from a historical archival component for me so what do what does this look like for anybody who needs to who knows that their history is not necessarily being represented um in a way that is valuable like my close friend is Bangladeshi my best friend since like seventh grade and we were discussing with her husband like the perceptions of Bangladesh and misrepresentations of history and their history between India and Pakistan and things that you don't learn commonly. What does it look like? You know, what does the Sankofa principle look like? How does, you know, does seeing another marginalized group and their process still contribute to the um, successful learning outcome for someone else of a different group? So, you know, broader questions, broad research questions later. <laughs> And then ownership and agency of historical material materials, just once again, um, assessing for students' understanding of that and making sure that we're getting that across clearly. Um, and this is not just for the game, this is also for the accompanying to teaching toolkit, obviously, um, and agency in preserving and telling stories. So do students understand that process and also seeing outcomes like there's National History Day um, and seeing ways in which talking to teachers about, you know, do students seem more active or involved in these processes, et cetera, et cetera. These are like our broader research questions. Um, and this is just for the pedagogy team. Um, the game design team have their own research questions. <laughs> like so we're exper experimenting with accessibility for disability. So testing out that and stuff like that. So, but, but these are the higher level, you know, our questions on this and then there's design questions. Um, and I believe that's everything. So I'm open to questions. I timed this uh, to leave room for that. Great. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, yeah, questions. We got a little bit of time. I have a question. You had said earlier um, you were using this for helping people with family history and genealogy, and that this is designed for mostly high school students. I was a professional genealogist for close to 20 years before I came back to grad school. And I often worked with people who had marginalized history um, in terms of their ancestors. And when, when I would work specifically with people who had African-American ancestry, they could get typically up to 1870 and, and of course have a very hard time before that. And so have you thought about how something like this can connect them to ancestors that they can't locate before 1870 and giving them that sense of validation. Um, I guess I'm asking that because oftentimes students would compare their quote, lack of research success. They'd compare that to people who, who had um, Eurocentric ancestry and could find people before them. And so how do you see what you've built here encouraging and, and uh, building confidence in other people who, who can't go back that far yet? But one of the readings we want to talk about, uh, a lesser known fact, uh, this is for the teaching toolkit as well. Um, many enslavers, many plantation owners, people who owned large numbers of slaves at the time of emancipation burned their records. So we have this understanding that it's not just that, you know, well, this is Sam who is roughly five foot eight and dark skinned. And that's like all we know, right? And his, maybe his age, but it's not just that. It's also that they burned sales receipts. So you can't even track which plantation Sam was originally born at or um, that there's a, a lost trail there. And I do think, and so part of it's two things. One, becoming familiar with the archive itself, right? Understanding how you can go about locating maybe even alternate ways of identifying uh, records by saying, you know, first of all, do I feel comfortable? Because that's actually archival intimidation is an area of, of study where people don't feel comfortable walking. The profession is 90 to 95% white. And then you walk into an archive that has a bunch of dead white men on the walls and the majority of the staff are white and the collections are predominantly, unless they're very specifically curated, so um, one, this was actually directly meant to, uh, to address archival intimidation by giving students the tools and language to understand what an archive is, how to go in. It's not like a library. You're not getting item level assistance. You've got to request specific boxes and then go through them yourselves. So this goes into that gamification to give them to the understanding and comfort of we're simulating you getting a box, opening the box, seeing that there's 30 folders in that box and you are going to have to go through all of them and to give them the comfort. So like there's that to the literature being there to, this is what we talk about agency and respect and responsibility and ethical access to say um, that in the use of language empowerment 
to say that you not being able to find those things, one, and I, I actually have said this to people multiple times, even if you can't find your exact, exact ancestors, there is pride in our generally shared ancestry. There is pride in being able to go back and learn this history and learn this. Uh, HBCUs are really important for that in a lot of ways too, um, in identity formation. For those of us who grew up in Black community, it's a little easier to have a shared sense of like knowing Black history and knowing, you know, when you are removed from that, having these collections, HBCUs, these Black specific spaces and breaking, uh, somebody else on Twitter was talking about the singularity of Blackness, the single narrative that we were all enslaved and can't find our history or Black American history started with enslavement. Um, breaking that understanding and giving students the understanding that these were conscious decisions that they can choose to research or hold accountable for has been shown, does actually impact, that goes into culturally relevant pedagogy as well, does uh, provide a sense of agency and reparation in some ways, right? Um, things like visiting the, um, the castle in Ghana, like go, even if you don't know that your ancestor came through the gate of Ghana, most Black people have a very visceral response to under to visiting the place which would have been the last place a number of enslaved people would have ever seen once being shipped out of out of the West Coast because it was a peace shipping port for enslaved people. So not the, the answer is unfortunately <laughs> that uh, providing access and agency to ancestry, even if it's not your exact ancestry, in many ways still it, it addresses that to a degree. Obviously, it can't replace all of it. Other questions? from the audience? Well, while you're thinking, I'll ask a question. Um, uh, thanks for a great talk, Jasmine. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in this idea of um, gamification and sort of how as much, you know, it, it allows us uh, to come up, overcome some of the intimidation of the institution, right? Um, and how, how have you, you and your, your team gone about sort of balancing the gamified aspect with the pedagogical aspects and um do you think, feel like there's a risk that the game could the game aspects could overshadow those in some way or how, how do you negotiate that i don't think that we feel as much uh i mean i think the most uh obvious answer was just like how do we make archival research uh fun <laughs> not boring at all um right. <laughs> because uh, the let's actually start from a more cognitive point by the time you get, unless you're a genealogical researcher, and even in that case, by the time you get to the point of doing archival research, oftentimes you have already had a pretty heavy introduction to the kind of scholarly pursuit of history or, or, or something like that, right? Even with, scholarly, with genealogical research, you've been digging into your family history. We're taking students who may not have had that triggering moment to make them interested in doing this research and trying to skip them into being interested in that. So the gamification component is meant to kind of accomplish that, to say, you probably don't care about Black art in the 1940s. That's fine. Like, you know, we are all like me, who was like in the ninth grade with a P, where taking AP art history, determined to become a P, to become an art a museum curator before I realized the job market was not going to be good for that. <laughs> but for those who were not, this the gamification serves as an incentive and to give that start, like, you know, I thought, I thought the Venus of Willendorf was fascinating and fun and great you know all of that stuff there are some people who look at that and they're like it's a rock with boobs I don't know what to tell you the gamification is supposed to compensate for that <laughs> and get them to that point the in terms of pedagogy we do have to balance out the sheer number of tracks we put in there are things where we can't have them you know how rote the clues have to be interesting the over and over again, if you're just encountering the same kinds of clues, like how do we condense and organize these, these clues and information in a way that doesn't overload the player and also simultaneously um, still accomplishes the end goal and doesn't bore, but also doesn't bore them, bore them as well. So I would say that's the biggest challenge with game design in this um, process with, with a specific type of subject. Thank you. Um, looks like there's a question in the chat from uh, Shishwan. Um, she asks, how would you separate physical play from digital play? Why virtual reality games for children? Do you think they can recognize reality versus virtual reality clearly? Or is that not so important? Actually, this goes into, so my independent study, because I was a double major, so it was art history and African-American studies. My independent study for African-American studies was uh, effective pedagogy for Black urban students. That's why I'm culturally relevant pedagogy and all of that stuff. Um, 
the big one of a, a big thing that came up was the success of multimedia education for black urban students. Um, this is attributed to a number of reasons. One, the role of music, rhythm, movement within African genealogy is like culture is, a, is an important thing, but also living in a city where there's constant noise and stimuli all the time. And these kids are not, you know, are coming for, with a different kind of like cognitive load, set of cognitive expectations. Uh, so I wanted to experiment with virtual reality because that's multimedia, right? You have sound, you have objects, you're interacting. Um, the line between digital play and physical play, I would say is the, so, Efficacy of virtual reality versus reality depends on, I think, discipline. Um, virtual reality has been shown to be very effective for like chemists who are looking at molecules and also uh, people who are studying cadavers. So they have found that actually you may have improved outcomes in dissection when you, uh, as opposed to actual real life cadavers. Uh, I do think that this kind of, this comes down to that concept of gamification. Once again, if you think about everything I've described, uh, those are processes. You are not necessarily like, is this a hydrogen? It's not about memorizing which molecules are which, but how those things come together. They're rearranging pr protons and all the other things to create these. And they're saying like, ah, now I understand how these things degrade and reconstruct and combine. Same thing for um, dissection. You're, it's the process. You're not like, this is a spleen. So much as you're like, if I cut here and here, this is generally where I should and should not cut. And there's, a, there is an organ here. It is the spleen. <laughs> Regardless, I know I should not cut it. <laughs> so I would say um, physical play, most people who do game design do both. Um, the people on our team do, they do both board games and physical play uh, and virtual games. I do think it's just a matter of which, like in my experience, Physical games are a little bit better because they're a little bit more controlled in scope for rote memory of facts. When did this happen? So if you think about Monopoly, you can probably all remember if you play enough of it or any board game, you probably remember like what value different properties have or do not pass the rules that you find on the card. They're much more limited. When you start thinking about virtual games, you don't think as much about like, you know, what's the hit point of this character so much as you're like, oh, you know, I need this character to jump this high or achieve this level. There's a there's a slight difference in cognitive process. So um, I would I feel <laughs> there's a lot of information, but the the short answer is I think physical play one in terms of efficacy of physical versus virtual play. I do think that it comes down to once again process versus rote memory. Like are you is your end goal to have them memorize information and learn information or memorize the process of some sort? And and I do think physical play may be better for that. Yes, I can send, I can always send them through Zach. I have a bunch of books on my desk. My um, bot, my supervisor is a whole game theory, feminist game theory approaches and things like that person. So I can send them through Zach if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. I'll pass those along. Any other questions? We have time for maybe one or two quick ones. So my, my favorite example for that is Mario 64. Like you don't yeah. remember any of the specifics, but you remember how to do things. You're like, I have to butt bounce on this. You remember the <laughs> process of winning, not necessarily always the win itself. Right, like, right, right. Order or whatever, game path. So it's maybe, yeah, the, and the processes and structures, like the, the cadavers you were talking about or the, or the molecules, relationships between elements mm -hmm. um, which are great in a 3D simulated space. Um, well, I'll, I'll ask one last question and let you get back to your, your Friday afternoon there. Um, the project, what, what sort of timeline are you, you uh, is your team working on? And then also, do you feel like the, the, the project you're creating could be portable to other archives? Um, how easy or hard might that, that be? So for a timeline, we're actually building out the recreated spaces now. Um, we're writing for a grant to bring in students to do the more detailed artistic components of all of it and to also get the teaching toolkit out and also do assessment on that. So for the prototype phase, we're going to roll out a teaching toolkit, the initial phase of the game and bring students in and do user testing, have teachers provide us feedback on implementation in the classroom. Um, and then bringing graduate students. So we're hoping to have the full thing all rolled out probably end of early 20, what year is it now? Early 2024, end of 2023. 
but we will have the base the basic space recreated and everything kind of ready to walk through probably along before like this year um <laughs> we're building that out now so if you just want to look around you know take a tour you're free you know you could do that um regarding the second and portability of this it'd be very portable once you get the under i mean you just have to pick the storylines that's like you know you got to get you would want to bring in experts if you wanted to teach the history of women in stem you could do it with the exact same process probably you just have to um one you would have to think about how inclusive your archive is this is a really most like i said broad covering time period you might have to have students visit or tour or borrow materials from multiple archives to accomplish the same scope but that's the actual base structure of the game would port perfectly fine. I was just thinking about the physical space, right? You're, so you're simulating the blocks and sexual reading room and archival spaces. And um, I think in, in sort of digital libraries, digital archives, we have this idea of like, oh, we're going to digitize everything and put it into databases and, and interfaces and people are going to interact with it in that way. Um, I wonder, yeah, if you think there's there's an advantage to kind of spatializing these materials rather than just making another flat, um, not flat, but like, you know, sort of another screen that you access it through creating this sort of 3D environment, if that has a cognitive benefit or, I mean, yeah. I do, yes. So the reason we didn't do that is to say like, okay, you can just go search for John W. Moses photographs, but it is extremely different. Anybody who's been in an archive knows it's a very different experience when you have that feeling of discovery, right? The idea of when, when you're looking online, you're getting a curated, a very, very curated, not that these things aren't curated, an archival collection is curated, but when you're digitizing, it's expensive. So you're getting the things that are the coolest, right? But the more specialized you are in your research, you don't really care about cool. You, the thing that's cool to you is what you're interested in, even if it's only cool to you. So this is supposed to simulate that experience of like discovering something that wasn't so easy to find per se, or that you had to make the connection, the incentivization of finding the next thing. So as opposed to being like, oh, I found this book and it says I might be interested in hyperlinked right over here to this thing saying, hey, I encountered this thing. I need to learn more about this. What do I do? Oh, I get points. Oh, I get to find the next thing. Oh, I did it. And that incentivization behind it does have a cognitive bearing in terms of, I mean, it's, it's that's the point of gamification, right? Like why play kitchen? Well, when you actually cook it, unless you really love cooking, it's boring. Most people, you don't, you hate it. You're like, just fried a grilled cheese sandwich. Great. <laughs> But in a game form, it's it's great, right? And when you play a video or when you're a kid and you're pretending, it's super fun. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, definitely. Well, I want to let you get back to your, your busy schedule there. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for taking the time and presenting your really, uh, really exciting project. And um, hopefully maybe we can, once it moves along a bit more, we can even share it here on, on campus and, you know, send over a build and we can have some of our students and faculty try it out you know yeah um, we're very excited and thank you for having me it's, great. Uh, forced me to put some things <laughs> <in>. <laughs> cool. great well thanks so much jasmine one last round of applause and um yeah have a, have a great weekend and thanks everyone who attended and uh if, if anyone has other questions please send them to me i'm, I'm happy to uh, send them to jasmine and we can continue the conversation offline Great. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Enjoy your weekends.